So we're in Romans 2.10. Romans. So I'm just going to paste what we have here up through 9 out of my Bible program. Facebook. So far what we saw was this leading to tonight's scriptures. In accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you were treasuring up for yourself wrath in a day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. So, so here we are in verse 10. And so I pasted that before. I'll paste it again. I wish I knew it wasn't going out earlier. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. As often is the case, both sides of an issue is explored. Paul has addressed the outcome when one chooses to do evil. Here he looks at the benefits to being someone who works what is good. It takes focus and dedication to try to do good works consistently. Even more so when we do them because it's our identity in Christ to do so and not a celebration for being his, for belonging to him. Hey, Kevin. Um, and not because we think we have to legalistically earn something. I was saying earlier when nobody could hear me that, that uh, I knew when I was saved there was a song and the song went like this. It was a debt I could not pay. It was a debt he did not owe. And I knew there was no way I could pay the sin debt that I had. But in retrospect, I can tell that I had, um, was working hard to pay God back or to get God's approval. And that's a plague in the body of Christ today. Uh, it's like little children jumping up and down trying to get his attention uh, and hoping that he'll approve of us and hoping that he'll He'll think we're good enough. When when Jesus was baptized, there was a voice coming from heaven that said, and there was a father saying, Behold my son in whom I'm well pleased. Now why did he say that? Well, Jesus hadn't done any miracles. He had made water into wine, or fish, loaves and fishes to feed the multitude, or walked on water, or, or healed anybody, or raised anyone from the dead. He had done no miracles yet. So if that was the case, his works weren't the reason that the father was well pleased. Why was he well pleased with him? Well, he says so in, the, in a statement. He says, behold my son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, the apostle Paul says in Romans that Jesus is the firstborn of many brothers or many brethren. And you and I, well, we're some of the brothers and sisters. We're some of the children of God. And as such, he is pleased with us. He is accepting of us. He loves us. He's well pleased. Why? Because, behold, my sons and daughters, he says. Now, having said that, he's not pleased with everything we do, and he's not pleased with everything we say, and he's not pleased with everything we neglect to do or say that he would have us do and say. It's not about that. In, in uh, 2 Corinthians, I believe it is, it says, right before he talks about being new creations, it says that we're no longer um, judged according to our flesh. It's not about our works. That's not what gains the approval of God. Becoming his child gains the approval of God. So the most 
um, impossible th thing there is is to become something you already are or to get something you already have. And so many of our brothers and sisters are exhausted because they're trying to get approval from God and they already have it. And they want him to be well pleased with them. And he already is. So why do we do these good works? We can do them out of celebration for being saved. We can do them out of gratefulness. We can do them because this is what we are. Jesus didn't do anything just so his father would approve. Jesus did things because his father did approve. And he did things that blessed the father because his works went with his identity. And that's what we need to be working on. So Paul says there are benefits for us to do this. And some commentators think that we harvest those benefits as we go. And some think they mostly have to do with later, when we're in heaven. And I tend to believe both those ideas. <clears throat> I believe we benefit now and we benefit later after we've crossed into the heavenly realm. Romans 2, verses 6 to 7, says this, and it's important that we remember and understand what we saw in verses 6 and 7. I'm going to repost it here. Who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. We should have to, we should remember that. Remember, the glory and the honor and the immortality they were seeking wasn't for themselves. They didn't want glory for themselves or honor for themselves or immortality. It wasn't about that, not their own. The first of these listed is glory and then honor. And we've already looked at the meanings of both. So we're not going to look at those again. But glory, honor, and peace to each one who works what is good. In this verse, Paul says that to everyone who works what is good instead of glory, honor, and immortality. The words peace and immortality are totally different. They're not interchangeable. Why then didn't Paul say the same thing in both verses? Most likely because glory and honor and immortality and peace are all qualities of God. In verse 10, he said, But glory and honor and peace to everyone who works with his good, to the Jew first, and also, and also to the Greek. Again, as a former Pharisee, Paul addresses the Jews first, since they had a longer relationship with the one true God. He knew that because of this, Jewish believers tended to think that they were superior to Gentile believers. And that's why Paul says this next in the next verse. I'm copying these out of my text and pasting them myself because I don't have anybody that will do it. Um, for there is no partiality with God. Now, the, the, new, the King James Version, that's the New King James. The King James Version says the same thing with, with, the diff, with using different words, King Jim, Jimmy words. And, and this is what he says. For there is no respect of persons with God. And if we didn't understand the language, we would read that and think that God does not respect or value people. Doesn't it sound like that when you read it out of the King James Version? In fact, it's misunderstanding verses like this one, which causes many people to think those things about God. 
The term in, in the King James, no respect to person, actually means exactly what the New King James Version says, that God is impartial. That's what the no respect to persons translates to in the Greek. It, doesn't, it means he doesn't practice favoritism for or against Jews or Gentiles. So there's no favoritism with God. And then I found something interesting in my research. So I'm going to quote that here out of Weist. His name is Weist, I think. It's W-U-E-S-T. I'm just going to quote the whole paragraph. I read this a new a new um, commentary I bought is is worst new uh, word studies in the Greek New Testament. This is what I spent some of my donations on. Um, speaking of which, I just want to thank you again on this platform because there's people in this room that have donated in the past and might in the future towards our radio outreach. It really helps us uh, when people do that. I don't hustle for that sort of thing. I just want you to know our sound quality this week is so much better because um, we're getting new equipment in. We have two new microphones and mic stands coming in that will be installed sometime this week. And then we have a, good, a new good one at, in the radio show. And uh, that, and I spend it also on materials and on Bible study materials and and uh, rent and things like that for this this space. So you really do make a difference in other people's lives. So anyway, this is what Wirtz said in his commentary. The Greek word uh, for respect of persons is made up of the word for face and the, and the verb receive. The compound word meaning to receive face Literally translated, the verse reads, For there is not receiving a face in the presence of God. That is, God does not receive anyone's face. By saying this, Paul means that everything he said in verses 9 and 10 apply to both groups equally. Jews and non-Jews. Greeks is another way of saying non-Jews. This is why... I have a personal pet peeve, and if you said this, I'm not going to hold it against you. But I have a personal pet peeve in the church when people even jokingly say, I'm God's favorite. And I know they're making funnies and making jokes and stuff like that, but I just don't believe that that is a valid thing to say. He loves us all. There's no respecter of people. He has no favorite. Now moving on, and if you think you are, I'm sorry. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. Romans 2.11 says that, and I, I choose to agree because the Bible says it. In verse 12, he says this. For as many as sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. When Paul says without law, he's referring to Gentiles, non-Jews. When he says in the law, he's referring to Jews. If you, As we go through Romans, you're going to see he's addressing both groups constantly. Some of the people know who he was as a Pharisee. And some of the Jews in Rome that get this letter are going to know he was a Pharisee. And he needs to make sure he they understand he doesn't see himself primarily as a Jew anymore, but as a child of the Most High God, as a believer in Christ. The Gentiles need to hear the same thing so that they will know that he's not going to side with the Jews against them, the Jewish believers with them. We know from later in this letter that sin has a payoff, death. How do we know that? Romans 6, 23a says that the wages of sin is death. So we know that's a truth. And we know that except for Jesus, every, every single human 
that ever has lived, is living, or will live, has sinned. Law or no law, Jew or Gentile, doesn't really matter. In Romans 3, 21 to 23, Paul's going to say this. Another famous section in Romans. But now the righteousness of God, <clears throat> apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ, Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, there's a lot of us that can quote, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but not have it in context like I just put it. He says, there's no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's basically what Paul is saying here in Romans 2.12. Whether they're Jews or Greeks, every one of them has sinned. Now we move on to verse 13. And this is the parenthetical statement. Because it's in parentheses. How's that for good scholarship? <laughs> for the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. And we know that nobody could do the law perfectly, and that's why Jesus had to come. I was telling someone earlier, if we could do this on our own, Jesus would have stayed home. But he couldn't. He had to come and do it for us. <clears throat> now, I'm going to paste this next part because it's a hard word to say. The word justified comes from a Greek word that I'm not even going to try to say. I don't want to hurt myself. Dikaio, I don't know. Dikai, D D I D, Kaio. Oh, it's not. It's not Kaio. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Uh, it ju it essentially means just and righteous, and this is a verb. So it means to do an action, to justify. And I learned something else interesting while doing my research. That's why it takes so long to write this. Um, because I'm learning stuff as I go and I'm checking everything out. I'm checking every single word out. So in the Complete Word Study Dictionary, I learned this. Verbs which, which end in the OO like that generally indicate bringing out that which a person is or that which is desired, <clears throat> but not usually referring to the mode in which the action takes place. In the case of this word, D-I-K-A-I-O-O, -O, it means to bring out, listen to this, bring out the fact that a person is righteous. The justification isn't bleaching our souls. It's teaching us that he made us righteous the instant we were saved. Now think about that. How many of us, and you can say something if you want, were told that even though we're saved, we're wretches. Or everything we do is filthy rags because we were sinners and we're still going to be sinners and how many of us have heard that i heard it you know and i i don't think it's true scripturally but i heard it but what this is saying is that the doers of the law will be justified in other words the righteousness that's inside of us will be shown forth it'll be visible and i think the primary person that needs to see it <clears throat> is each one of us. We need to see 
that God has made us righteous from the moment of salvation. This means then rather than it being the case of us doing uh, doing good to make us righteous, our righteous works really reveal the righteousness that we have within ourselves from Christ, not from our own righteous little deeds. And not doing it reveals that inside we're not righteous at heart. The reason many of us don't do good works is because we might not be born again. But when we are, it just flows out. We find ourselves doing things. Now, I will say there's a caveat to that. If we're wounded, and almost everybody has been, sometimes there's this takes time for a person to heal enough to think about what somebody else might need, and good works come out of that. Um, I had a guy that I, pa I still pastor that when we first met, and I was talking about, you know, serving other people. He looked at me when, when that was my counseling room over there, and this was a separate room. He said, he said, well, I don't have any use for anybody else at all. And I just cringed because I think, well, you know, we're in a body of Christ, you know, it's important how we do good works and, 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 you know, look for ways to serve one another and all that. And I just didn't even say anything about it because it just bothered me. And he got a measure of healing and all of us are still being healed. But he was driving across the Walmart parking lot here in town and um, he threw his brakes on and I go, what? Because I thought maybe he saw a car coming because everybody in Walmart here thinks that it's one big bumper car game. And and I thought maybe he saw a car that was out of control. And he said, that lady needs help with her car. And I looked at him and I said, I thought you didn't care about other people. And he, he looked at me with this confused look on his face because he wasn't used to doing good works like that. Does that make sense? He wasn't used to doing it. He was used to surviving. James, in James 1, as we studied, when we studied the book of James, starting in verse 22, encourages us to do this. <clears throat> he says, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. For if anyone... If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, immediately forgets what kind of man he is. Was. <clears throat> but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. The assumption is that at gatherings of the body of Christ, God's word is read and discussed. It's not always the case. Some of these places stress man-made issues and trends or even sports over God's word. If you're in one of those places, really, please, find some place else that loves the Bible. While it's good to stay awake, and pay attention, and even maybe take notes while someone else lectures on the Bible, it's much more important that we actually do something with what we hear and what we learn. The problem is that so few ever hear a message on what to do with the things they are being taught in the religious system which has supplanted the simplicity of the first century church. Let me reread that because I found a mistake. The problem is that so few ever hear a message on what to do with the things they're being taught. And the religious system, which has supplanted the simplicity of the first century church, created two classes of believers 
which God never did. Clergy and laity. And in this system, this extra-biblical system, which is the norm across the body of Christ, it has become the job, if you will, of clergy to do the word. And it's the job of laity to pay them to do the word for them and on their behalf. And this is totally different from what the Bible teaches. How can we repent from this religious travesty? Frankly, this might be hopelessness speaking, but I don't think it's going to change until Jesus comes back. I think people love doing what they love, whether it's in the Bible or not. But if we were to repent, how would we repent from this religious travesty? Well, let's just take God at his word. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God says this. What I'm talking about is working around the constraints of the institution. God says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans which I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. God always has had plans for everybody he's created. And let's look in Ephesians 2.10, which I know I hit hard when we studied Ephesians. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now this... Um, what I'm about to read from the Life Application New Testament Commentary is what one commentary says about this topic. And I thought it was well put. Those faithful Jews who attended attend the synagogues every Sabbath and hear God's word read over and over may consider themselves to be righteous but just hearing is not enough because it's not merely knowing the law that brings God's approval. Those who do good and those who obey the law will be declared right in God's sight. This includes both Jews and Gentiles. It also says see Leviticus 18.5 Oh, James not James. Wow. A typo in there. Um, James 1, 22-25 The obedience that Paul describes is perfect and well beyond our reach. Our being right, made right with God must be sought and found elsewhere. Paul effectively closes many appealing doors when he describes the only one which leads to eternal life. The Life Application New Testament Commentary. In Romans 2.12, we saw this. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. And knowing what God said and then doing it was simply the right thing to do and healthy for all people. And it still is. I looked up that, that verse in Leviticus. And this is what it says. Basically it says we benefit when we do this. You, judge, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. It brings life to us. <clears throat> in verse 13 he says, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but also the doers of the law will be justified. This idea shows up in two places. In several places. One of them is here. James 1.22 
and be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. But also in Matthew 7, 21 and 24, which I'm going to quote as one verse. To make the point. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Why? Because it reveals that we are indeed born again. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. <clears throat> it is so important that we practice, which means to, to habitually live out what the Lord teaches us through the scriptures. And this underscores the absolute need for us to read and study the scriptures for ourselves and not be spiritually lazy and let someone else do it for us. That's what I'm teaching about right now on my radio show. So we're going to stop here for tonight. We had to restart because my sound wasn't working. Yay, Facebook. And um, really it was my it was my equipment that wasn't on, but I can't tell because of Facebook. So we're going to stop here and we'll pick up from here next time. We're going to uh, pray and then we're going to have a couple of little announcements. Um, Father God, I thank you so much for this Bible study. I thank you for people who come and be a part of it one time or on a regular basis. I thank you for those who view it later on Facebook and who will be all confused when they hear the first five minutes is silent because uh, uh, I don't know how to fix that on Facebook. I ask you, Father, that I'll be with those who watch this on YouTube and in other places that I'm I'm making it available. I ask you to bless us with the things that we learn so we can more, more grasp the reality of how you look at our lives and how we ought to live. Father, I ask you to provoke us to good works. I ask you to make good uh, potential good works evident to us. There's so much needs doing, and I know we're not supposed to do all of it. But you have something for each of us. And I ask you, I, I don't I ask you to share your plans that you have for us. I ask you to be with us and walk through us and walk with us as we go through these things. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Remember that um, That you can always go to this website, click on videos, and the first video that comes up is going to link you to my last one on YouTube.